Hi, my name is Crystal. Good morning, and we would like to welcome you to SCAC. If this is your first time here, please feel free to let us know in the chat box below, and we'll make sure to greet you with a warm welcome. Additionally, if you are also a young adult or a working professional looking for a community, we would love to invite you to join one of our virtual community groups or young adult fellowships um, during this time. If you want more information, please see the video description below. Thank you again for joining us. Please remove any distractions, your cell phones, and prepare your hearts for worship.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who. Every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
Well, good morning, church. Uh, welcome to our online service. I'm so glad that you can join us this morning, and I'm so grateful too. Uh, I don't say it quite enough that uh, just grateful that you join us every Sunday uh, for so many time, uh, so many months here, as we have gone online. Um, so if you can, please say hello in uh, in the chat box below, so we you can say hello back and greet you and. Uh, you know, we are really busy um, just preparing for our return to in-person Sunday uh, worship service um, starting on Sunday, August 1. Uh, so uh, as we are, are preparing to do so, would you, uh, can I just ask that you be praying, uh, be praying for our church, uh, just be praying for our reopening plans and our and all the communities that are working behind the scenes and and, but more importantly, would you pray and ask the Holy Spirit, you know, to, to give you a greater longing, uh, to be together in worship and to be together in communion and within community, you know? Would you ask that the Spirit will birth in you a, a, a longing, uh, for each other that's born out of a supernatural love? And then, um, and, and a challenge, you know, what, as, as we as we get closer to August 1, would you reach out and invite a, a friend to come uh, and join us on that day as we gather? We just want to be celebrative and, and just enjoy being together again. And so as we, you know, as we come back together into this room, and I just pray that, that we would do so um, with more of a longing for Jesus. And, and more of a longing for this sweeter and, and a deeper fellowship that we have ever had before. So if you have your Bibles, um, just invite you to open to John, the Gospel of John chapter 13. You know, today um, we begin a new series, a series that's entitled uh, Together. You know, I was thinking about this series because um, uh, reflecting on, on March 13th, 2020, the doors here at SCAC were closed and, and everything moved online. You know, I was on sabbatical at that time and like all of you, I was stuck at home, um, unable to travel or even gather with family and friends. And, and like you, we started watching services online. So I just want to give a shout out to, uh, to Pastor Roy, our worship team, uh, Pastor Steve, um, Stacy, and our early ch childhood director, and, and every, uh, all the other people behind the scenes who worked so hard um, to, to make this shift online possible. So thank you so much for all that you have done. And, and at that time, you know, I really thought it would only be for a month or at the most three months or something like that. And then we would come back together and, and, and continue on like we've always had. But of course, that was not to be. The online worship and fellowship became our new normal. And screens and Zooms and, 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 and those other things, online meetings, replaced the face-to-face -face interactions. And, and gatherings and, and travels became this, this kind of like a precious memory of the past. And you know, he's thinking about isolation and, and, and the resulting um, issue with mental health. They really became real alarming issues. And, and all the while we, we sat at home and we, we witnessed our, our, our nation suffer and our world suffer as many people lost their lives and their livelihood to COVID. And so add to all of that, this, this, the racial protests that came on last summer from the killings of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor and, and Ahmaud Arbery and countless others. And, and then later on, add to that the rise in Asian American hate crimes across this nation. And then add to, add, add to that an election season unlike any other and the insurrection that took place on January 6th. And here we were, right? Stuck at home watching all of these and, and in every way imaginable, you know? This past year and a half has thrown everything at us to prevent us from being together and to divide our hearts and our minds from one another. So as we prepare to, to come back together in person, I am under no delusion that coming back together will be easy. 
You know, of course, I'm looking forward. There's some excitement for us being together, but how will we, we relate to each other after all that has happened in our world? Are we going to do things differently? Or are we, are we going to just continue to, to doing the same thing that we have always been, been doing? And, and what does it mean to truly be united for this next season in our church's history? And so in this seven part series that we want to take time to remind ourselves of what it means to be family and to be community. The questions in this series uh, we are going to tackle are as we transition out of the pandemic, how will we focus on what truly matters in life? And how can we find a a better way through the conflicts that has arisen? Um, How do we align our social life uh, with the life of of a community? How do we discover what truly uh, unites us and and binds us to one another? And how will we face the emotional issues that, that maybe we discovered through being isolated? And lastly, how do we um, help each other fight the battles, our personal battles that we are facing? You know, um, you know, church. As as August one comes, uh, let's 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 all come. Let's let's fill this place, and may we be a people who are shaped by God's own heart. All right. So let's let's pray, and then as we and, and enter this first in our series uh, uh, together. Father, thank you. Uh, Thank you for sustaining us these many months. God, we are still here. We are still um, praying. We are still fellowshipping. We are still planning for our future. We are still dreaming together. God, your church continues to grow and move. But Father, we also know that there is an aching and longing in our hearts to be together and to be together in such a way that we will not uh, continue business as usual, but Lord, that we would be together as a people marked out for you who listens to the Holy Spirit, who, who is sent to be revolutionaries in this world, to, to dream bigger dreams. God, would you help us as we transition from pandemic into a life together again, that we would do it well, that we would base it in love, that we would base it in the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we would be for each other, that we would care for each other. And so, Father, we submit this new series to you. We submit our plans to you. We ask, God, that you would fill this place with songs of deliverance, with, 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 with sounds of worship, with, with, with the voice of the Holy Spirit, that we would hear you and that we would follow you, Jesus. And God, we need you more than ever. We need you in our world. We need you to, to, to be the voice against the violence and the heartbreaks and the tragedies that we see every day. So God, we submit our lives to you. We submit our plans again to you. We ask your blessing today as your word goes forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if we're talking about transitioning out of pandemic, where, what do we do and where do we start? So the answer, uh, the simple answer is this, that we must start with love. Love must be one of the foundational elements of any Christ-centered community. You know, it's it's a love that is, is for each other. It's a love that pursues healing and reconciliation, that seeks another's good over our own. It is a love that finds its source and its mission in Jesus Christ. And of course, you know, why do we start with love? Because as I think back through this year and a half, I, you know, everything that, that we have read about, every, every um, violence and, and, and the, the tragedies of our world came into full view, right? Because we, we were stuck at home. We were watching these things uh, in real life. 
And we have seen how this pandemic and, and the social and political unrest have promoted this, this hatred and this narrative of violence in our world. And we don't need to look far to see just how violence has become a part of our everyday life. You know, I think about this, this COVID, this, this virus, you know, as of today, over 4 million people worldwide have lost their lives to COVID. And, and in, in the United States, 605,000 have passed because of this virus. And this past uh, July 4th weekend, according to a report from CNN, there were 233 total, uh, 233 fatal shootings and 618 injured people by gun violence in the United States. You know, in this past year, year 2020, there were 122 reported cases of anti-Asian American hate crimes from 16 of the most populous cities in America. This is a 150% increase from the previous year. Also in 2020, there were reported and confirmed uh, 618 mass shooting events, uh, which was the highest ever recorded in two decades. And of, of July 8, 2021, there have been 341 reported confirmed mass shootings. And experts say that this year will equal or exceed the numbers from 2020. And so I, I think about these stats, I think about these things, and, and, I, and, and you know, our world just doesn't seem violent. Violence is all around us. And though we may not feel it, right? We may not feel these violence. I am thankful that we, it has not reached many of us here, but we carry this violence, this, this sense of impending doom, like this sense of, of nervousness. We carry that in our bodies and we bring it into the relationships with one another. See, this violence expresses itself uh, through the fears that we have for our future. It's through the sadness of lost jobs or, or lost loved ones and, and through the anxieties of, of seeing brutality and violence in our streets and injustices in our communities. And we see it through the hatred and the frustrations against those with different political allegiance. Violence it impacts not just physically, but it impacts our bodies and our soul. And after such a tumultuous year, year and a half, we must learn how to love, to counter violence in the world and in our bodies with this love and, and to recenter our together, togetherness upon the love of Jesus. And so what is this love that Jesus seeks uh, for us to know that what is this love that overcomes violence? In John chapter 13, in verses 34 to 35, Jesus speaks these words to his disciples. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. You know, amen. It's the word of God, right? And, and so this is a remarkable statement if you consider the circumstances. And so this was the night before Jesus would be betrayed and, and arrested and tortured and crucified. And here he was at a Passover supper with his disciples. And, and as the usual custom back in those days, a servant, that, a servant of the house would, would wash the feet of those who enter the room. But there was no one to do so for Jesus and his disciples. So as John records that Jesus loved these disciples to the end, and he gets up and, and he puts the robe around him and he washes his disciples' feet even the feet of the one 
who would soon betray him. You see, love is, is, is not just an idea. It was personified and it was lived out in reality. And you know, this statement from Jesus is even more remarkable when you consider the context. The command to love is sandwiched between the sad pronouncement and the debate about Jesus' leaving and how when he was and how where he was going his disciples could not follow and so this was Jesus basically saying goodbye and leaving his last will and testament and so here he was preparing his followers for a new reality in the coming days and so this, this command, this, this love will not just be some affections and emotions. It will be presence. Jesus' presence with them and with the world. But what is most remarkable is Jesus' words. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, this command to love, is, it, is not, it is not new. Love for God and, and for neighbor is as ancient as God himself, who himself is love. But what is new is how this love is now embodied and modeled for us and for the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Here in Christ, we have a standard of what genuine godly love is like. So if we are to relearn how to love, if we are to counter the violence in our world and inside our bodies with this love and recenter our togetherness in love, we need to understand and live out this new standard of what love is about according to Jesus. And to do this, there are two key elements in understanding this command from Christ to his disciples and to us. Two elements. So the first element is this, know the source of love. We have to know the source of love. See the word as in the phrase, as I have loved you, has a causative sense. And so another way to read this, that we can read this is, love one another from the love I have for you. Right. So we can read it, uh, love one another from the love I have for you. So the kind of love, this kind of love that overcomes violence in all of its form will not come from you and me. It will, it will not come from more effort or more education or more striving because we have no control over this matter. There is no sense of earning here. This love that overcomes violence will come from God. And it will be the same love that Jesus has for you right now, a love that you already know and have experienced. And how remarkable is this love of Jesus for you and I? First of all, this love is a preceding love meaning that it was there before we were born, before we were even uh, thought about, you know, and God thought of us, he loved us, before we could love in, in return. See, John would write in a letter, in one of his letters later, that we love because he first loved us. So what that means as love as, as a preceding love is that you and my, you and I, we, we were born in love, no matter the circumstances. And we have always been loved by God, no matter what we have done. 
And so if you can just turn to someone and tell them that God has always loved you. Go ahead and do that. God has always loved you. And so, the first, you know, this, this love is a preceding love. Secondly, this love is a continuing love. Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This love of God is a constant in the face of overwhelming odds. It is ongoing, it is persistent, it is steady, it is enduring. Nothing in this life or the next, nothing physical nor spiritual can ever stop the continual flow of God's love for you and over you. But yet the statement that Jesus says, he makes a bold assumption. He assumes that you know and are experiencing his love. He assumes that you are daily coming to love's well and, and drawing water and drinking. He assumes that you are receiving his love daily. You know, but from my experience, God's love is easy on the ears, but difficult on the heart to believe. It is just one of those statements that just, you hear it and it's, you just, it just passes away or, or you think it's just too good to be true or we don't even know what it means. Because we can't imagine a love that puts no conditions behind it. We feel unworthy of it. We, we think, how could God love me if he knows everything that I have done or thought about? And so when we speak of God's love, we have all these objections, right? All these buts. But what about sin? Neither life nor death. What about idols in my life? Neither angels nor demons. What about, uh, what about COVID or some other pandemic? neither the present nor the future. Well, what about, what about governments and, and, and dictators, nor any powers? What about hell, neither height nor depth? Well, what about violence and, and injustices, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you and me and other people from the continual love of God that is in Christ Jesus. David Benner, in his amazing book, Surrender to Love, writes this at the very start. Regardless of what you have come to believe about God, based on your life experience. The truth is that when God thinks of you, love swells in his heart and a smile comes to his face. God bursts with love for humans. He is far from being emotionally uninvolved with his creation. God's bias toward us is strong, persistent, and positive. The Christian God choose to be known as love, and that love pervades every aspect of God's relationship with us. You, my brothers and sisters, are love. There is no buts with God. You don't have to work for it or produce it. You simply need to relax, jump in it, and let it sweep over you. You simply need to let your love enjoy its source. Man, when someone loves you like that, 
It changes you and it changes your world. Sisters and brothers, in what ways have God loved or is loving you today, right now? In what ways do you see him speaking his love, shouting his love, delighting in you right now? Are you connected to the source of love? Do you hear his invitation to be loved? And so to, to understand um, Jesus' command to love, the first crucial element is, is to know the source of love. The second element is just as crucial. Know how to love. It's good, it's crucial to, to know the source of love, but it's also crucial to know how to love. In verse 35, Jesus says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so here, in just this verse, we are, giving the, we are given the who and the how of love. So the who of love is to love the church. The who of love is to love the church. Godly love, we see, we see godly love is always outward. It's always outward centered. For John, the focus of Jesus' command here is to love those in the church, the one another's, the other disciples. And Matthew and Luke in their writings will expand this love to include everyone even our enemies. But here in John, Jesus' love through us is directed to one, one another in the church. And so, um, you know, this past year and a half, we have seen things about the church that breaks our hearts. You know, throughout history, the church has proven time and time again to be aligned with power instead of sacrifice and, and control instead of, of liberation and division instead of reconciliation. You know, the church was silent when it should have spoken up. It showed hate when it should have shown love, it emphasized comfort when it needed to promote risk. It talked more of fear and shame than it did of peace and hope and so on. And recent surveys have shown that there, there is an increasing number of people leaving the church. And you know, I don't blame those who leave you know, I grieve and, and repent from the ways that I have contributed to it. But I also realize that many who leave the church do so not because they hate the church. Rather, they needed to get away to recover from their disappointments with the church. And their hurt was so great because their love and hope for the church was so strong. And so as I think about these people and, and those who have left, their pains have shown us that we have failed to love one another well. And so as we regather, I don't know, how, how much do you love the church? How much do you uh, see this community as your family and, and, and your brothers and sisters? Again, it is not about trying harder. It has everything to do with you knowing the source of love in Christ who gave his life for the church. And as we know Jesus, the source, he will move us towards each other and offering us opportunities and chances to show love and receive love. You know, in coming back together, can we somehow make sure that the foundation of our community, the thing that binds us together as family, is this radical and Christ-centered love for one another? 
And so the who is to love the church. And the how, the how is to love in ways that are noticeable. The how is to love in ways that are noticeable. Look at what Jesus says, by this everyone, meaning everyone outside, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so this Jesus commanded love has a missionary goal. Other people outside these walls, they will look and notice and know that we follow Jesus. And you know, every time I read this, I am amazed that, that this is how it works. You know, we are not told that the world will know we are Jesus' disciples by our preaching, nor will they know our, by our service for the community, nor by our worship productions or, or our many programs. No, Jesus says that everyone outside will know that you follow me if you love one another. And love has always been the way to transform hearts to God. Love demonstrates to a watching world that God is real because it is the kind of love that could only come from Him. It was this love that was poured out in sacrifices and in blood that grew the church throughout the Roman Empire and then to the ends of the earth. And it will be still this kind of love poured out that will finish the mission in our day, Lord willing. So how are we called to love one another? It simply is this, love each other until the world notices and believe that we are disciples of Jesus. You know, the church is known by many things, but rarely is it love. As we regather again, I, I wonder, what do you want SCAC to be known for? You know, we can debate methods and, and strategies and, and budgets, but, but as we gather back together, can we agree and pray together with one heart and one mind that we want to be known by our love for each other, by the practical ways that we support and champion each other, by the ways we pursue healing and reconciliation, by the way we celebrate each other's successes. You know, wouldn't it be great if, if the people from our community would say of us, and not just the pastors, uh, but that, that, that church over there, those people, they sure do love each other well. So a new commandment, church, Jesus says, I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In a world full of violence, how radical and crucial are these words of Christ and how critical it is for us to know the source of love and live out the how of love for each other and for our world. And so to close, I, 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 I want us to put this into practice as we look to our regathering. You know, there was this, there was this post on Twitter that, that really challenged the way that I want to approach church when we return. It's this family that came up with what they call rules of engagement for when we go to church. And that great rules of engagement for when we go to church. And they listed three rules that they are committed to following once they come back together. 
And so I just invite you, if you want to, you can just write this down and, and, and commit it to following them with me as we go back. So here are the three rules they wrote. Number one, an alone person in our gathering is an emergency. Isn't that great? An alone person in our gathering is an emergency. Number th rule number two, friends can wait. Isn't that great? Rule number two, friends can wait. And rule number three, the final rule, introduce a newcomer to someone else. Introduce a newcomer to someone else. You know, brothers and sisters, would you, would you sign on to this? Or maybe sit down with your family and create your own rule of engagements for when we come back together. But would you agree with me that no one in our church will ever be alone or feel lonely? That hanging with friends can wait while we care for those who are new and those who are unconnected and different. That we would do our best to connect people with others to, by introducing them to the family and by following up with them. Now, these are just simple actions. But as we do them, may the Lord show a watching world that we are disciples of Jesus. Amen. I can't wait to be with you all. And so as we go, can I just remind you again, brothers and sisters, that you are deeply loved by Jesus. And so let us sing these songs to the one whose love is everlasting and never failing. Amen.
See you next time.